able to see that. So I'll just check if I can hear you on the Yeah. So we're able to get started again. Okay, yeah. So this need not be close. This receiver is uh, pretty strong. So it's so it can be this far. Okay, I can get to it. And this is only for this speaker. Mm -hmm. and what I'm speaking is in this yeah. laptop itself. Yeah. Okay, then that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so welcome back, uh, friends. So we are um, in the session, which is originally to be the concluding session, but let us have it now for logistical reasons. So I'll take about uh, an hour. I don't uh, take too long. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll give some remarks, which are all uh, slightly broad in their perspective. Therefore, uh, you have an easier time. Your head may be already quite busy with a lot of math and computing stuff. So this is a bit lightweight. OK, so you can relax and just see uh, how, how we think we can uh, go forward. So these are the various points I'll cover, just each of them like two, three minutes each, roughly. Uh, so I'll give you some statistics. Uh, then I'll argue why we should, uh, if you want to have any uh, aspect uh, you know, on microstructure simulations, so we should start getting used to Linux. And then uh, how to take advantage of the multiprocessor computing. And then how we chose singularity. And then already we are implementing that in this release itself. and. Uh, for uh, industry uh, participants, uh, how to leverage public cloud. And then how do we integrate this with an ICME platform? We have one such platform in India from uh, TCS. So how does that work, for example? And then some code development is happening now in our group on Sickle, which will be the future of uh, GPU computing uh, uh, in the coming years. And then one case study, just very quickly uh, to show something that we have done, which you are all going to be able to do that uh, because now the solvers are available with you and some comments on the outlook for future developments okay so uh, many of us uh, uh, do not actually uh, feel that uh, the uh, microstructural simulations are hpc but they are uh, so usually when people say who needs a high performance computer usually it is a weather prediction people or nuclear people or cfd people but they don't talk about metallurgists and it's very wrong uh, it's already now about uh, 11 years that a, a very prestigious prize called ACM Gordon Bell Prize was awarded uh, to uh, Aoki uh, for doing phase field simulations at a very high scale. And this is the highest award from the ACM, which is a community of computer scientists. And uh, it is doing uh, phase field simulations. And they have gone to PETA scale computing way back 10 years back. So it shows that uh, microstructure simulation is a HPC problem. So whenever somebody asks, you can go and dig up this kind of a reference to show that it is indeed PETA scale computing capable. Today, of course, it is going to EXA scale. So how the HPC has been evolving uh, over the last uh, uh, about 20 years, the statistics are all available on top500.org website. Uh, they are updated every six months, uh, once in June and once in November. These are all declaration-based statistics. People have to declare. So you may have a supercomputer. You don't talk about it. So the website doesn't know about it. But it has been done by people just to forecast. Uh, you can see the path that uh, there is a very steady growth, uh, which is uh, um, showing that the HPC development is happening very aggressively. And you can already see the y-axis. Uh, E-flop is exaflop. That is 1,000 petaflops. And uh, the fastest computer in the world has already crossed it. That means that currently we are in the exascale scale computing regime okay, in the world, in the globally. And uh, so we are in the pit of flop computing regime in India and so on. Okay, And uh, so if you look at uh, what all those supercomputers fastest in the world, I mean, what kind of uh, hardware yeah. they have. So the number one in the world is at the Oak Ridge now. Uh, currently. Um, it was uh, Fugaku in Japan till last year. So it is the AMD uh, hardware that is there in uh, Frontier uh, cluster, AMD Instinct. And um, you would see that uh, one of our solvers, uh, which OpenCL, will run blazing fast on AMD hardware. We already uh, tried that out. And uh, if you see the um, second one, it is actually ARM-based uh, architecture. Uh, and then the third one is again AMD. Um, and if you look at the numbers, uh, R peak, okay, it's well above one exascale. 
and um, some broad uh, comments this is for us to make a decision if we want to basically leverage the supercomputers that are all over the world what kind of a systems we should be familiar with so if you look at the distribution of the top 500 supercomputers in the world 100% uh, of them run linux okay 100% there is no exception so how much ever other operating systems may talk it's all linux everywhere including ibm where they have their own operating system x but they still use uh, linux red hat linux that is on their supercomputers so which means that uh, you can um, take advantage of those machines if you know how linux operates and luckily for us ubuntu is featuring also on the supercomputer so which means the ubuntu operating system in your laptop is the same thing that runs on a supercomputer so if you get used to ubuntu you are good to go on a supercomputer when you have access so we have to take a decision if you want to be in um, high performance computing getting used to linux is a must and look at the countries um, you can see that china and the us dominate the uh, system shares between them they have more than half of the world's supercomputers and uh, on uh, the performance also if you see uh, though the china has more numbers uh, the best of the computers are still with america but uh, overall performance is still china is leading and so then uh, um, which segments they are actually located in so if you look at this plot looked very different about 5 years back in 5 years back the industry segment has only 25% but today it's already reaching 46 uh, approaching 50 percent which means industry started to take advantage of supercomputers um, as of six months back uh, one commercial public cloud was in the top 10 in the world azure cloud was in top 10 which means that uh, today industries can pay and use supercomputers and they started to take advantage thanks to aml kind of applications they started leveraging so industry is having a higher footprint so Several years back, if somebody is very good in supercomputing, they have to be in research or on an academic job. But today, you can actually hope for an industry job and do supercomputing, and that's a very good news. And uh, if you look at the accelerators, uh, majority of them are NVIDIA. There's only one AMD Instinct series, but all of them, all the rest are in NVIDIA, which means that NVIDIA hardware is really taken, uh, you know, uh, very high uh, point uh, in uh, HPC. And uh, they have also been supporting uh, not only CUDA but also OpenCL. Uh, so our solvers will be able to run on most of these uh, hardwares. And so where are we? So we are at uh, a position uh, 18th in the world at this moment. Okay, and uh, we have been at much better positions in the past, and we constitute a pathetic 0.8 percent of the system shares in the world for a population that is actually the highest in the world. So this is something that many of us uh, should reflect on. And why is it so? Uh, because we don't have too many people who are knowledgeable in using supercomputers. They don't uh, you know, occupy them um, in big enough numbers that there is a hunger created and investment keeps coming in to make more and more supercomputers in the country. So, and anyone who has uh, fast supercomputer means that they are solving their problems faster. And you can see China and US are at the top. And uh, there are some usual uh, suspects like Germany is always has been in the top five. They have never slipped uh, in that sense. So like that, if you look at, uh, we must actually introspect and uh, encourage more and more people to learn how to work in supercomputing environment so that we can solve our problems more complex and bigger problems uh, faster. And how have we been faring over the years? This, this numbers I have just taken from the website and plotted it. So the y-axis is reversed as it should be. So uh, after 2016, we have been really falling. We have not been doing well. In, before that, we were in the top 10 in the world, even as good as sixth in the world once. But now we are not good. Uh, in fact, in 2020, 2020, we were actually very low, 24th in the world or something. So, um, so with the induction of more and more uh, NSM uh, supercomputers, we will improve the ranking, but uh, ultimately it is the people who actually will drive it. And so this trend also should be a reminder that, you know, we have to wake up and uh, do something about it. And uh, it then kind of interconnects, uh, it's a very technical point, uh, nothing much to discuss, but I want to just show you that uh, the gray uh, point on the left hand side, 10G Ethernet is also 
featuring the top 500 which means 10g ethernet is very easily accessible the commodity uh, you know switches that you can buy okay so which means that if you have multiple uh, desktop computers or good machines you can actually invest in a 10g switch and you can already start combining all of them to a mini cluster and start getting some performance uh, maybe not as uh, scalable as really a melanox or 100g ethernet but uh, it will at least work to give you larger scale problems to tackle instead of going for a very expensive computer you can assemble all of the ones you have and let us say once in a month somebody wants to run a big job they can use all of the computers in the lab and run it remaining time you can use them as individual computers that's not a problem so uh, this uh, slide is to encourage that uh, you know industries also who have uh, several computers should think of making them as a cluster and start using them on the right hand side are the vendors you can see it's again the usual suspect so what kind of vendors uh, computers are present in top 500 help you in deciding which computers you should buy uh, separately later on you can assemble to a cluster okay so uh, i have also mentioned earlier that linux is with the na nature natural choice as native os uh, because 100% of the computers are linux so one good news for those who have uh, Lin windows operating system on their laptops is that uh, they have the uh, windows subsystem for linux so you can go to the powershell uh, type the command wsl minus minus install and it will install the wsl and ubuntu shell will be created and in windows 10 it used to be only the command line but uh, wsl2 which is available from windows 11 onwards and also now on windows 10 uh, with an update Uh, so it is actually with gui which means that if you run an application which opens windows uh, pop up pops up in windows that will work on uh, windows also operating system so uh, you can start using uh, ubuntu linux on a windows laptop to get familiarized so that on on a good day you can just you know switch over to linux fully and then uh, you know start taking advantage so please uh, do not assume that because you have a windows laptop you can't do anything in uh, ubuntu it is already possible uh, and i have given the link for you to go and read up about it and start using it and um, uh, we need some uh, very basic skills uh, to get around you would have already seen in the ins uh, in the beginning of this workshop uh, instructions on installation and uh, moving things around copying stuff running commands etc so uh, the beginners usually have a fear of command line most of the people who use gui environment on windows on a laptop usually they have a fear there is nothing wrong to admit that uh, one can get over it by uh, trying out with the ubuntu shell which is already available with you no new installation is required wsl is not going to disturb anything else it won't make your laptop go slow or anything like that so you can start and here i have uh, put up a link to a course that i offer uh, it's a shameless advertisement but all the videos are for free and it's for education purpose so i have no hesitation in advertising it uh, they are all available on youtube so about 30 videos uh, coming almost about 22 or 23 hours of duration and these are all videos made uh, on uh, linux environment uh, using a tool called uh, uh, obs studio i have recorded in obs studio which is again open source and i have edited the videos myself using a tool called kden live and then i have published them on youtube so completely open source and linux based and uh, it is done as a demo model i am not talking with slides in those videos i am actually typing commands and you are seeing the output so you can pause the video type the same thing on your laptop see what happens and then uh, proceed so if you go through all the videos i promise you that at the end of it you will be able to write your own scripts Okay, shell scripts and uh, which perform fairly sophisticated operations. So do try it out. Uh, even if you go through half the number of lectures, I would say you can follow the instructions about installation and you can do it all by yourself. Okay, so please do that and get over the fear of using the command line. Okay, so uh, do we have even faster computers for us to try? So again, um, supercomputers doesn't mean you have to only go somewhere else. So most of the time, your laptops have processors like this. they have i9 processor or ryzen etc which are all multi core so whenever you have a multi core processor remember that they gave you multi core to run multiple operations at the same time you can open multiple browser windows you can open uh, microsoft office window you can open a video player in the background multiple things 
but you can also use all of them simultaneously to solve your problem which is exactly the capability of let us say the multi physics solver with open form you know you can use all of them same time and uh, uh, if you are buying a workstation uh, if you have a xeon processor or epic processor they have really very good number of cores epic for example 64 cores is a very uh, routinely available workstation class processor and you can run fairly sophisticated programs on that and and so when you are buying a machine just watch out for the number of cores and uh, amd currently gives you lot more number of cores for the same price uh, but you know intel comes up with a compiler set which is going to be very fast with their own processor so either way you have an advantage and you can put them together and um, on multiple uh, cps on a motherboard is going to help you with uh, some programs like this open form solver we have in the solver set uh, they can actually take advantage of it okay you can run it on Uh, these without any extra effort and uh, so uh, but these are slightly expensive when you want more than one cpu on a motherboard it's a bit expensive uh, about let us say a workstation takes about 2 to 3 lakhs per unit uh, a dual cpu workstation may take about 6 to 7 lakhs um, but it will be worth because uh, you can actually run your program on all the cores simultaneously okay and uh, when you network you had a supercomputer so whenever we talk about supercomputer do not get intimidated it is nothing but networked computers individually and uh, our programs which are with mpi library already know how to take advantage of these network computers and run all of them and therefore you can take advantage of these computers so if you happen to network computers in your lab or have access into a hpc facility then uh, some of our solvers are already capable of running all of them okay so you have seen the benchmark that abic has shown to you 4000 cores the program is scaling very neatly which means that they are actually massively scalable ones so uh, coming to gpus here again uh, thanks to the uh, gaming freaks among the youth all over the world uh, they have been buying uh, gaming cards and making it cheaper so today we have got gpus which are actually very affordable for the kind of processing speed that they are capable okay so nvidia for example uh, it has a very humongous uh, card now 80 gb card 80 gb means on a single gpu you can run a very fairly large 3d simulation already okay you can, one simulation completely on one gpu is possible and if you look at the cost per uh, performance it is actually cheaper are uh, than having cpu however the solvers are to be done in a special language open cl or cuda which are also included in our solvers so a nvidia card with about 10 teraflops capability is available now uh, which means actually it will be you know equal to maybe about 10 to 15 um, desktop computers together okay and in terms of power consumption each desktop may take about 250 watts and this will alone will take about 250 watts so for less power you can get actually more computational power so uh, radeon is again uh, another you know behemoth uh, you can see 47 teraflops okay and 128 gb ram which is the largest size ram that was uh, available in the world at the time it was released and these cards uh, are the ones which are populating the world's fastest computer in the uh, in octreg national laboratory so these are actually very powerful so the good news is that uh, in phase field Uh, microsim solvers are the only ones which can actually take advantage of these these hardware there is no other uh, phase field solver which can run on these hardware even if you want to buy and make your simulations faster so ours is the only ones which can run on this so this is again new this was not uh, there in the news last workshop so in the last 6 months this has happened intel actually has started to catch up with the gpu a market uh, it is dominated by nvidia so intel has to catch up and they have done that so they had what is called intel discrete graphics and they have now gone off to launch their own uh, data center gpus which are not for uh, monitors but they are only to crunch numbers and they have a whopping 52 teraflops in double precision just in a single card 52 teraflops okay and uh, they have uh, uh, humongous memory 128 gb ram which means if you have one such card you can do a 3d simulation just in one card and that one card takes about 500 watt or so power how do you use like uh, use this for like general computer? for example we have the um, uh, open cl uh, solver kk solver the kk solver will run on this okay. it will run on that 
okay because uh, this uh, gpus uh, support open cl instructions and kk solver is run written using open cl so straight away it will run on that okay so we have these hardware so in india it's not yet available but uh, i believe in few months it will start coming in and so you will start hearing about this more in the next uh, you know several months and uh, because it is from intel uh, it is compatible with one api which means that intel compiler can optimize it even further to make it uh, even better so the market is getting ready to launch uh, accelerators so our solvers are already capable of them and therefore we can take advantage of that so what is the essential difference between the cpu and gpu just a small remark so in the in the case of gpu it cannot perform very sophisticated operations but it can crunch numbers at blazing speed and it has a lot of compute units okay several thousands of compute units and each of them actually can work on a part of an array the entire array is sitting on the gp memory you can see 128 gb ram means that the entire array which is for our uh, uh, phase field variable for example or composition variable all of them can sit in the memory and each compute eating can work on one one element in the array and then they can rotate their roles and then compute the whole array in parallel and they come at uh, uh, fairly good speed 1600 uh, megahertz clocking speed and therefore they compute so this is a very uh, simplest way of explaining what is the difference uh, they can't perform very uh, sophisticated operations like a cpu but for number crunching they are very very uh, very good today most of the clusters are of the third type heterogeneous clusters you have got uh, clusters where computers are there with multiple cpus and maybe one or up to four gpus in them and then those computers are connected using a network switch this is how it is so if you have access to one compute node already you can work on multiple gpus and and then if you have more than one compute node accessible using mpi you can then distribute the load to each of them and using the open cl or cuda you can distribute the load to the respective gpus that capability is there in one of our solvers already the mpi plus open cl is already available as a capability so if you have heterogeneous clusters our uh, uh, microsim solvers are already good to go and that is the architecture for most of the uh, hardware in the world at this moment so um, in this process we chose to uh, package them in uh, singularity images for portability for the following reasons you would have already seen some advantage we could get up and running with the images very fast today um, it was not so for example in the first workshop where we had to do a lot of work to get the right library versions so the idea is as follows many of the libraries we need um, they have different versions that are compatible with each other and whenever you update the os the minimum version that you are supposed to install also will change so you will very soon get into a deadlock that is you have upgraded the os but your libraries cannot be downgraded and therefore you are in a deadlock and that is exactly where the idea of virtual environment comes you have a environment which is separate from the os and within that environment the libraries are self contained as you choose okay and uh, so the containers uh, are a very good idea and uh, there are many many types of containers that are there the largest ones are basically virtual machines themselves you can have a vm and then you can start installing whatever you want on it and run but vm is actually like a you know i would say with a heavy workload uh, overhead because it runs everything else on the open system no need to do that uh, docker is a container uh, which is very popular but docker needs uh, you to have super user permissions for you to launch it and and again that is not good because whenever you run your codes on a supercomputer or a cluster you are not the super user you know you are only a user so it's not convenient to use docker so snap is again another technology on ubuntu where you can package some libraries so that they are not incompatible with the rest of the os okay but snap is going down ubuntu is going to dump snap uh, i heard uh, because it has not picked up much uh, uh, traction in the last few years kubernetes are also containers so they are meant for like web services where massively thousands of uh, images can run and uh, provide uh, services technically we can also launch such kubernetes in the public cloud on supercomputing but uh, they are not so efficient in talking to each other there is a lot of latency to talk to each other they are meant to only directly talk to the consumer but not with each other so therefore that's not recommended for us so singularity seems to be the best choice and uh, it is already meant for hpc so that's why we chose it 
and uh, we hope to provide uh, many different uh, singularity images for different different uh, application domains in the months to come and we already distributed uh, some singularity images in this workshop already okay and uh, uh, we uh, know for sure that the performance overhead is not much that is when you run it as a singularity image or when you run it directly by compiling it the difference is not much maybe one or two percentage that's all okay so we have chosen singularity image and it has solved a lot of headache for us now um, for the industry folk i want to just mention something uh, so if you want to have a, a high performance computing environment uh, it requires initially quite a significant uh, capital expenditure so not only the computers uh, you need to pay for the uninterrupted power supply uh, because if power gets cut off then that's a disaster for any computing machinery and um, all the power that you draw from the socket it's all going to be heat finally after so you have to basically maintain the temperature also and which means you need to have a precision air conditioning 24 by 7 so uh, apart from computers you have to pay for the ups and for the ac so there is a significant uh, initial capital expenditure and this may be one of the reasons why in india where the industries are unfortunately known to not spend too much on r and d uh, are on a back foot because they are thinking twice whether it will uh, you know be worthwhile or not so uh, i remember uh, that point in my mind and this why i am proposing something uh, we also need to have backup hardware for the storage systems and um, uh, uptime has to be really good uh, and it has to be shared across uh, uh, to other groups so that you know uh, the cost is uh, uh, gotten back uh, because each computer will live for 3 4 years you know after that it's only a room heater because much much faster computers will come later so so if your computer is 3 years old it's like a room heater only okay and and uh, so you need to use uh, it maximum in those 3 months 3 years so so that you can get the money back so industry is always looking at in you know, roi am i getting the returns on my investment so in that sense there is also one more unfortunate thing about the computers is that there is a rapid evolution of hardware by the time you figure out how to install your drivers and get it up they have released the next hardware okay 3 years is a one generation actually okay for us 3 years is only part of a phd maybe but uh, you know in the case of uh, computers it's like one generation okay so uh, we have to accept that um, it's moving fast so for industry there is a uh, good alternative that is possible today we can actually do it on a public cloud so today we have a very wide range of gpus available on the public cloud as accelerators so if you go to amazon uh, web services or uh, microsoft azure cloud or google cloud you have gpus available mostly nvidia uh, in the case of uh, uh, aws amd hardware also is available okay and uh, so if you can actually use them uh, it is very good option so that you can quickly try out you can see whether it is giving you the results you want whether you know it's useful for you before you invest okay so that's a very good proposition and uh, we uh, will demonstrate uh, maybe as a webinar sometime in uh, you know near future in about couple of months how to do it using microsoft microsim uh, solvers on a public cloud we will do that we have already tried it out i have tried it on a uh, amazon cloud already with the rocket ml uh, infrastructure but i will do it on raw Infra infrastructure itself for myself and show a demo soon so singularity images will make that easy because you just need to copy the image to the cloud and start running okay so it is possible okay and um, one of the things that we forget when we go to the cloud is whenever you instantiate a machine virtual machine it will be created afresh for you they will take less to, less than a minute to create the machine itself so every time you instantiate you get a new machine <clears throat> so if you have lot of installation done there is no point keeping it for long time because you know once you switch off uh, you know you are likely to basically lose it because whenever you you know detach it and then attach with a new hardware you are likely to get a new uh, vm and uh, so it's a very good idea to write a script which will get all the dependencies whenever a new machine comes so that is also made easy to using the singularity images so you don't have to have too many dependencies just copy the singularity image get the singularity runtime execution environment and you are ready to go so i expect that we have a storage box like 250 gb or something into which we copy the singularity images the scripts etc attach it with a vm and then run copy the data onto the storage box copy it back to your desktop machine you are ready to go 
so we can illustrate how how easy it is etc we will do that now what about the um, way to connect it so there is luckily in a linux environment there is a set of tools one of them i am mentioning it here xrdp for remote desktop protocol so you can just install it in ubuntu uh, in just four or five commands you can actually have a desktop environment showing you the windows of whatever is the vm running in the cloud so it's almost like the computer is next door almost okay so the technology is very advanced the bandwidths are very good so uh, today it's possible for you to have a computer in the cloud and run these calculations and uh, if somebody can configure the vm for you then basically you have got it up and running very fast and if you want it to be very protected and not uh, you know uh, open to people to get in etc some industries have very severe restrictions on you know is it protected is it having a vpn and uh, um, proof uh, you know uh, from you know hackers getting in etc so there are very sophisticated technologies like wireguard and which are also made commercially available with a click of a button tail scale Uh, which are alternatives to vpn i have already used tail scale very recently and i can definitely say that it is a uh, very very uh, fast way of uh, having a wire guard uh, protocol uh, to connect with machine so that the port numbers and uh, the the services are invisible to people and therefore you can work on machines uh, with all the protection that you want as an industry client so our solvers are ready to take advantage of all these technologies and uh, if you want to still try out without even paying uh, it is available uh, my student chandran is here he has also been using this uh, for some time intel developer cloud is available for free if you just you uh, know register for yourself an account will be given you can uh, do ssh into the cloud and start running the jobs for free and for few months to try out and you can use all the advantages of intel uh, compilers and intel hardware and if it uh, looks good then you can go ahead and then you know do your procurement uh, accordingly um, so there are also such free credits available on public clouds also 300 dollars credit is available but if you look at the intel offering uh, it's way more than 300 dollars i think okay so because almost for 6 months you can use it for free with unlimited number of queues and all that so um, we have uh, tried our solvers on intel already and it all works very very smooth okay now uh, there are some features uh, i don't want to read out all these things uh, because slides are already available we will copy them on to the uh, github repository also but i want to just mention again in the beginning we were not uh, ready but now we have standardized hdf5 as a way to write the files and which takes advantage of the parallel uh, file writing uh, scheme which means that the speed up is very good okay so this is the most advanced file format uh, for uh, you know hpc applications and that library is already integrated in microsim which means that when you go to uh, large supercomputers there is no slowing down when it comes to writing files and reading them okay so we already have advantages there visualization you are already seeing that uh, uh, microsim has made it easier you have a good uh, uh, post processing tool where the matrix are all generated and my images can be seen so can you also see it on the cloud yes okay using the remote desktop you can actually see the visualization on the public cloud also and you can also bring the data and do it on your own laptop because computation may take time but visualization doesn't take much time you can do that and um, because uh, the data is written in a format that paraview can read because vtk files are read by paraview so technically even if you have a very huge computation then uh, the formats are such that paraview can actually uh, show them for you in a very professional manner so therefore uh, using uh, microsim doesn't take away any of your ability to visualize the data as you like okay so many many metrics are already provided but it still doesn't take away your ability to do it yourself so the data is available for you to view it in paraview okay here is one example of how does it plug in okay now we have done the solvers where does it go so here is an example the paper is actually linked below uh, just a last year's paper on uh, welding so uh, let us say there was a query also in the last talk about welding so uh, if you look at a uh, welding simulation in the past uh, what people do is they would they do welding experiment look at the microstructure and see how to get the right welding and be done they are done today actually we can understand computationally completely so we can perform a welding simulation and then extract the temperature gradient and cooling rate that is uh, acting at the fusion zone 
and then you can use these two as input parameters for the phase field abhik has already alerted to you that it can go into the uh, the the input files already so you can perform those phase field simulations using microsim and microsim will then give you the micro segregation data and that data can then be used to see what would be the you know richest solute that is there in the between the dendrites and such a solute what kind of a solidification path it will undergo the ttt curves can be looked at to see what phases will form and then you can comment on what the microstructure should be okay an example i will give you uh, here in an example of niobium variation in such a world you can see the scale uh, so you could see that a low temperature gradient and intermediate cooling rate will give you uh, a larger uh, niobium segregation and uh, a low cooling rate and intermediate temperature gradient will give you lower niobium segregation and niobium segregation is directly correlated with lavis phase formation and you can comment on what happens this kind of a variation the cooling rate is varied in a range temperature gradient is varied in a range this kind of a variation of the parametric space is what is called as a design space the design space is different for different processes okay but the design space can be populated by microstructure simulations discretely and then with interpolations once you have a very fast simulation tool available so microsim can generate output let us say 5 by 5 25 simulations can fill the design space and then you can interpolate and get the sweet point as you like okay so that is some capability that we have now and uh, how does it help in icme approach icme is all about finding the optimum so that you can save the computational time experimental trials and get to the correct product development etc and in the process of doing that uh, optimization concurrent execution is not realistic what i mean by concurrent execution is welding simulation is done same time in the same time scale phase field simulation cannot be done because welding simulation takes one or two hours phase field may take you know several tens of hours because the um magnitude of the computation is different so concurrently you cannot do but design space can come in between where several simulations can be done they can actually be populating the design space through a script or proper script which can be called as service registration and then you know the design space can be looked up by the icme approach to extract what would be the segregation when the cooling rate is so and so and temperature gradient is so and so etc so every time it needs an output it doesn't need to run a phase field simulation it just looks it up from the design space and uses it and such a repository can be created so these repositories in the past were very difficult because phase field simulations themselves are very hectic but now that they are a bit faster you can create them and make a repository and then have a surrogate model to feed the input to a icme platform okay this is something that uh, you know is encouraging because the industry clients can start taking an advantage of that okay for many many applications including additive manufacturing okay here is again the length scales of uh, various uh, models and again i want to stress the point about uh, the uh, concurrency not being possible so if you look at the x axis it is computational effort or time okay and on the y axis it's the amount of information okay and its outcome so if you look at the thermocal databases like that it is less effort and very high value okay because very quickly you can get some output is a good value definitely and if you look at uh, uh, let us say neural networks uh, they are actually also very quick but uh, they are of limited value because they are only as good as the training data set if the data set is not appropriate you can't actually get much out of it and uh, you don't um, get the new insights what are not out there already uh, because physics has to be put in by you okay now uh, if you look at the phase field it is actually on the right hand side which means the computational effort is a bit more but not as bad as ab initio calculations ab initio calculations are notorious they take very very long time not as bad but in terms of the amount of information they are very high what i mean by that is if you run one um, micro success simulation you get segregation information of all the elements you get uh, various curvatures that are present you get the length scales of the you know Uh, parametric uh, formations like secondary dendrite arm formations etc precipitate sizes the curvatures uh, their morphology so much information okay which means that the value of the output is more but effort also is more so if you are able to do these calculations faster then you have advantage and some of our solvers are able to do that okay so if you are able to uh, uh, you know perform the calculations uh, for a larger domain and faster definitely the outcome is going to be very valuable okay 
and um, uh, some of these uh, tools like fem analysis etc they are usually behind the license walls they are commercial tools and uh, let us say genetic algorithm they are actually very very time consuming for global optimization etc so um, phase field solvers like microsim being uh, open source and free they don't have these license walls or authentication walls you can run them wherever you want and uh, therefore they can take advantage uh, if you want to run let us say a, a, a commercial uh, fem uh, software on a cluster the license cost itself will kill you because it will cost per core and if you want to run on 1000 cores you have to buy 1000 licenses okay and so therefore uh, the value of open source will come now okay so you don't need so many licenses it's all free anyway okay so uh, the paradigms also i just want to mention the future perspective as we go along so if you look at hpc paradigms uh, mpi is already implemented by us um, open mpi and open acc are directive based uh, paradigms to do the par parallel uh, calculations we have not used it but it is meant for people who are writing codes uh, and they don't want to write so many calls to send the data receive the data etc so they are very useful but uh, we have not used that in our uh, uh, solvers and on the right hand side you have got nvidia cuda open cl and uh, so on which are meant for the gpus and the one uh, in orange color sickle is a new development okay it is very popular in the very recent past and uh, intel has got one api available to let you compile sickle codes and uh, for linux environment the one api compiler is available for free uh, for education purposes so you can take advantage of that so uh, opencl has been uh, able to run on uh, gpu cpus of all types therefore it was a very good choice and uh, we have our solver on opencl environment already and sql is actually a a, a standard now okay sql actually is an international standard like opencl opencl is an international standard cuda is not cuda is a proprietary uh, standard okay so sql uh, is an international standard to write uh, data parallel c++ codes and intel 1 api uh, is a implementation okay the data parallel c++ implementation of intel is an implementation of sql there is another uh, implementation of sql called compute cpp it's a separate implementation by another company and so there could be more implementations coming the idea of sql is that you can write the code in c++ and when you compile it it can run on the cpu using multiple cores or on the gpu if it is available which is very beautiful because you can write once and run on many many different platforms so i expect that in the years to come a new program development will be in sql and uh, they will run on the multiple environments as and when whichever is available to people okay but it will always be more efficient to write cuda code for you something like that right uh, performance portability is being guaranteed by these people partly because on the back end they are actually passing it on to the same Uh, machine language as what cuda would convert or uh, uh, opencl would convert okay so so because the intermediate language that runs finally is the same uh, they expect that actually there will be performance uh, parity performance parity is being uh, claimed and um, there are some features uh, uh, like for example uh, you know nvidia when it launched cuda the concept of global memory you don't have to pass the data separately to the uh, gpus those things are already inbuilt in uh, sql environment so sql would know that this is needed by the gpu and perform a call to send it automatically so some of those features are coming in uh, but uh, they are meant for new program development because you have to write the codes afresh uh, the parallel the programming itself needs fairly good understanding of c++ or uh, uh, i would say open open uh, uh, object oriented programming basically so the book which will teach you that is already free it's open so that's also a good idea the compiler is available for free the book is available for free and you can run them on a cloud dev cloud which is also free so those who are now students entering their phd are uh, very lucky because you can then learn all of these then be future compatible okay and um, um, just some some more points that uh, you don't need to dump your uh, old codes cura can be converted to sql now so they are actually converters available and opencl also all the kernels in opencl can be used as it is in the sql so therefore you don't actually need to rewrite completely converters and reusability is available in sql and therefore i have a feeling that uh, uh, new code development will start integrating 
other codes as you go along. Uh, there are some libraries which may need some time. For example, BLA's library has been implemented painstakingly on CUDA, and CUDA Blast is quite powerful. So such uh, libraries on SQL, like SQL Blast, for example. Okay, it may take time. People may have to take some time to get it. But if you are having your own algorithms, your own solvers, I mean, you can make advantage of it very soon. If you are dependent on other algorithms, maybe you have to wait for some time for them to be available. And in the code, in the code development, there are these various steps. And in the list C++ is the one which we need to remember uh, because that seems to be now the future compatible one. And whenever you write codes, um, we have to profile them and see where is it, uh, you know, going slow and parallelize it, etc. We have done that with all the solvers till now. Okay, so we have saw parallelized all the hotspots, and therefore, uh, you know, our programs because of that only are uh, scalable. Otherwise, we would not have reached that kind of a scaling. And uh, how can we make even faster? So this is where the algorithms will come. So the um, good uh, uh, analogy is that. Uh, on a you know eight lane highway, uh, people can go fast, but let us say you are in a bullock cart uh, as opposed to Lamborghini. Obviously, you know that is a limiting step. The highway will take you faster, but what you are sitting on is slower. So, I have a feeling that while the new hardware is coming, uh, your algorithm is going to be the limitation, which means that now we have to think hard. How can we come up with the newer algorithms so that our solvers can be much faster? And that is going to be the uh, motivation for the younger people to learn and uh, come in and um, uh, when we are thinking of algorithms uh, we are trained to think in a serial manner because of the way we are studying but uh, the newer generation we must think parallel we have to think that the execution is going to be done parallelly and the parallel thinking is not easy it has to be taught okay you know you have to teach it to yourself uh, how to think of parallel algorithms because it's not natural because our natural way of doing things also is sequential as a as a daily life okay so that is something that uh, younger students should pay attention to okay and when you program do 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 it uh, you know properly efficiently with documentation and all that and uh, always validate you have already seen uh, a big stock we have validated all the models with all the solvers and ensure that they are all correct so that is very important you have to validate uh, all the versions and ensure that it is a complete compatibility and the benchmarking of the speed up and all those things. And uh, scalability limit, you have to also understand you cannot keep on making faster. Uh, there is a limit at which you can say, okay, this is the fastest I can get and with that I will stop. Okay, and so that is also important. Okay, and all the programs are going to be run batch wise. That is, it's not interactive while it is running. Okay, the batch wise it runs. If you have seen already the demonstration of the MicroSIM solvers, as soon as you click on the execute one, the solver is running and throwing some log on the screen, and it just keeps running by itself. Okay, so uh, this is how it is going to be run on HPS. You don't have some images being shown to you every five seconds saying that you know this is how it's evolving. Okay, that is not how it can run faster. So therefore, you have to get used to that. And uh, our solvers also can stop and run from where it left. So that is capability is already there. So if you have a shell and you can run something on it, uh, that is how, what is the optimal. And we have ensured that our solvers are like that. And that is how you should also get used to. You may be tempted to see some uh, uh, very front ends where everything seems to be done in front of you uh, visually. But remember, visual environment of computing cannot go to supercomputers. Because supercomputers, computing is done on headless workstations. Headless as in they don't have a screen attached to the compute nodes. Okay, so you have to understand that you can't see what is running. You have to wait for the run to be over and look at the data. So this is a mode in which if you are comfortable, then you can take advantage. Okay, so just a quick case study. This is not to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the study itself. Uh, that is a, that's not the purpose. And I want to tell you Mohan's solvers to make this kind of a study are actually available with you now. Okay, so that's what I wanted to motivate. Okay. Mohan will present something tomorrow about the solvers more. This is again to uh, um, motivate some of the industry clients that uh, to understand microstructure evolution additive manufacturing, the solvers that are necessary are already available in microstem. Okay, so they are already there. Okay, so the sol when we started doing this problem, we found it is enormous uh, because it's a you know 2000 cube is what we need for a reasonable size domain and a million time steps minimum to get some microstructure evolution and at least five. Uh, variables uh, even if it turn away alloy will take five variables totally so it's a very huge computation and we have done it on a supercomputer with multiple gpus 
and that's how we are able to get this and uh, what uh, mohan has implemented is what is there in the kk solver he has implemented a 27 point stencil with a fixed temperature gradient for directional solidification and uh, he has done the uh, the slicing of uh, data to divide it across multiple devices and the array itself is in running on uh, individual compute units using gpu so mpi for slicing the domain and then uh, opencl to run it on separate compute units on that and uh, uh, the code is written in opencl so that uh, any uh, hotspot anything that takes lot of time is running on a kernel to off offload it to the gpu okay so that is what is done so lot of kern kernels are already present which you can read and see how it is done so each of these kernels can directly copied on to a a sql code and then you can start doing it uh, on multiple platforms using one api and that is something that we will be also doing it in the future okay and um, uh, care has been taken to ensure that the code will run and with the very reasonable uh, performance parity uh, across amd nvidia and intel all the three okay so we have done it on all the three intel had a accelerator called xeon 5 card we have done it on that card also they have dis discontinued that card and now they have come up with uh, discrete graphics and then now intel data center gpu so it will come will be compatible because it runs open cl so definitely it will work okay so that part we have already come uh, compared okay and the uh, the architecture which is for open cl implementation has been taken advantage of the concept of local memory for the compute unit and global memory for the gpu and global memory for the host all of these have been taken uh, note of so that the data transfer is already taken uh, into account and uh, looking at the queue if you see how the data we have ensured that the data transfer and computation are done uh, in fine grain manner so that when you are doing the computation there are multiple operations that are simultaneously happening so we see the data transfer and computation are done in parallel so that the scaling is done so uh, we have an achievement uh, here on amd card we have reached about 60% of the theoretical speed of the card theoretical speed 60% which even the amd people were very amazed because uh, normally implementation when you do you don't reach that much 10% to 25% you reach that's a big deal but we have reached that speed which means that the parallelism is uh, quite very carefully done and it has been debugged very extensively using code excel etc so mohan gets credit for doing that and it's now also now uh, available to all of you through one of the solvers scaling is done to ensure that you know it is uh, parallel so these are all small scale compared to what abik has shown but it has already been benchmarked okay so here are some nice uh, simulations uh, to show you the segregation of various elements in additive manufacturing you will see cellular microstructures with segregation of elements in uh, you know ups and downs at a particular length scale and these are benchmarked with experimental details so the experimental alloy is inconel 718 and for that alloy the segregation uh, studies are done and uh, whenever you have any 3d printing on a 718 you don't need to worry about how the segregation will be all that is done now it's available as a capability of uh, these solvers okay and these kind of 3d simulations are all now quite easily possible within a reasonable time okay so you are seeing the contours of two different compositions uh, superposed uh, and you can then look at how the solute transfer happens between the arms you can rotate them and see the physics of what is happening and uh, you can see beautiful dendrites in 3d and uh, you can relate them with what you see in the experimental data also so all these are now um, not possible with any commercial uh, phase field software that is out there in the market and uh, it is possible with these and uh, uh, and and with a reasonable time okay be reasonable time in just you know a few hours you can do it uh, with this kind of simulations and uh, you could also look at the three dimensional connectivity of uh, various uh, you know contours uh, to understand the solute transfer aspect okay and uh, benchmark them with experiments you can see the experimental image on the top right and the simulation on the uh, left bottom and you can see very nice scaling and you can also look at the length scales they are also very close uh, so we can actually simulate very realistic microstructures uh, using these solvers okay quantitatively and also qualitatively uh, that is the capability that is there so why i am showing this uh, is because i want to motivate you that 
the solvers that are giving are not some toy solvers that you can run and show some nice pictures and no they are real this alloy for example is 718 alloy okay as important as 718 super alloy and those kind of microstructures can be reproduced okay so now finally some couple of slides to show the outlook for future developments so um, in future we have to talk to the lower lens scale and higher lens scale models using phase field so we will take inputs from multiple dynamics outcome as uh, lower lens scale coming in so the interface attachment kinetics or anisotropy strength etc we can take them as inputs and we can provide outputs to the higher lens scales like for example cellular automaton or fem uh, or uh, you know higher lens scale models and uh, give the microstructures to uh, do homogenization and then make some average properties of microstructures so that lens scale bridging is going to happen and uh, we have already started to do that in our respective groups we can also create lot of data sets to possibly create uh, surrogate models like machine learning so that you can uh, you know acquire data faster for a icm integration scheme so that capability is also there uh, more physics is always welcome that is going to be an endless endeavor so we are adding uh, more physics uh, for example in my group we are adding uh, uh, the the butler volmer equation um, and uh, elastic strain effects uh, that is not yet part of the microsoft microsim uh, solvers but it will be there in the future versions and similarly other physics are being added uh, by our uh, collaborative team so that will continue to happen um, integration of uh, uh, the the microstructures with uh, let us say uh, dislocation dynamics uh, calculations so that microstructure evolution is affecting the dislocation dynamics calculations to predict creep rates realistically and that is something that is also possible and some work is going on that direction so so all these are possible because we can now assume that the phase field solvers are very robust and uh, well established and we can move on to the other things and that is what is going to happen and we will definitely be uh, thinking about faster algorithms for very specific problems that will continue to happen and uh, we have already started to dish out the singularity images uh, to make it easy for you to run and we will make case specific singularity images for industry users if they have a particular type of a uh, domain that they want to simulate again and again so we will do that as uh, you know research uh, projects with respect to industries if they are interested and uh, so that is one capability that uh, we would like to project as the future work um, here are some techniques uh, and uh, lens scale limitations and time scale limitations if you take structural fem calculations they go to very large lens scales only and they can do for uh, simulations for a long time and if you look at the leftmost bottom uh, dft simulations they are for a very tiny scale and they are for a very small lens scale and in between they are all in between so these gaps are all uh, getting smaller because of higher supercomputing capabilities because uh, in the last 10 years of this paper definitely the capabilities are increased but physics also has increased and therefore the gap actually still remain and they are getting bridged with some hybrid techniques so we now have some techniques like coarse grained molecular dynamics and kinetic monte carlo okay and multi scale crystal plasticity these are all still very very expensive calculations but they help in bridging so a lot of codes will be getting uh, ready in the future so we expect that now that the regular solvers for many of the tools are available the the intermediate scales will start getting bridged so supercomputing is not done and dusted uh, students should be thinking that there is still lot more to do uh, so if you are a very good programmer with good physics understanding there is a enormous amount of things to do uh, with the computational capability and so stay motivated to uh, you know write lot of programs and there is a lot of uh, need for them in the industrial applications still and so i would like to then uh, conclude by making this statement i hope you will agree uh, otherwise you can also express it uh, as a part of the q and a so i want to claim saying that microstructure evolution using hpc is now accessible for all okay uh, because it's all there on github you can download it and you can start using it and i want to claim that the gpu compatibility is forward compatible that is because we have already initiated the sql programming we have our solvers that are compatible with the sql environment so which is forward compatible we can uh, you know use it in future also okay and the faster computing capability using more cpus and that is thousands of cpus and gpus is also ready so again i hope you will be convinced because we have shown the benchmarks and uh, 
for multiple GPUs as well as thousands of CPUs, the scaling capability. And uh, the building example I showed you also shows that microstructure evolution is ready to plug into ICME workflows. Uh, in our group, we have done ICME workflows for multiple problems, but uh, it is also now capability of any of you, because if you want to do it, one of the bottlenecks in the past was what to do for microstructure simulation, because that was not available for everybody. But now that these are all available, you can say that you can also plug it in. So you can attempt ICME approach for uh, different, different problems. For building and additive manufacturing, it is done. It means like we know how to do that. So with that, I thank you all. And uh, yeah, we have stayed well within time. So a few minutes if you have any questions. Uh, otherwise, I conclude this would be the future scope of how we are going. Thank you. We will see uh, on the uh, chat window if there is any question. Any questions physically? So just I will recollect the question from Aditya Pandey. He's asking the uh, dendrite growth based on thermal gradient cooling rate. You know, I have reinforced what Abhik has already mentioned. You know, we have been doing that and it's very much doable with uh, the solvers that we have here. So I encourage you to try it out yourself and reach us, reach us out if you have issues. So you can also do that. Can we differentiate with the before and after state treatment, like the multiple boundaries, columnar grains, or after state treatment, there are some tail phases, or strengthening phases like the gamma prime, gamma double. Yeah, so uh, heat treatment actually is a process after solidification is over. So what we have uh, seen is that uh, the segregation length scales in additive manufacturing are roughly one tenth to one fiftieth of the casting. They are submicron. So during heat treatment, these uh, segregations get evened out very fast. So what we have shown by these simulations is we calculate that by the time you want to ramp up and hold, the homogenization is done. So like ASTM prescribes some homogenization duration followed by heat treatment. You can drop the homogenization. You don't need to do straight away go to the aging. And it gives you very good uh, properties. And then the precipitate you mentioned, we can actually calculate the precipitate sizes. We have found that they also come out to be very small because the segregations are very fine and well distributed. So we can get small precipitates like 20 nanometers and then giving very high strength. So that benchmarking we have done in our group. So computationally, most of it is uh, done, but they are one after other. That is solidification simulation is separate. Then the aging treatment where the precipitates are coming out and growing, that is separate. There are two different solvers. You can do one after other. That is doable. That we have done like that only. Shape also. Yes, yes, yes. You have already yeah. seen a, a demo of how the sh shapes will be affected yeah. by various parameters. Abhik has shown in the previous solvers. So that is a very much present. For the alloys that uh, we have done, uh, the sizes are so, so small that the elastic induced uh, shape changes were not seen. So it was too small. But uh, if you have uh, uh, long uh, heat treatments of uh, cast microstructures, uh, you can see those uh, shape changes quite uh, well. They are, they are already available in the solver. Capability is there. Why I mentioned 7180 is because it's an industrial alloy with multiple components. So our solvers can do all those components to take into account. So that is the thing. I mean, it's a real alloy that we can uh, take into account. Thanks. Thank you. Questions? Okay, that's fine. It's a, it's a long day with a lot of uh, heavy duty stuff. So, so let them digest it. Okay, And we are always available to answer your queries. Feel free to post it uh, directly to us or uh, the MicroSIM website has uh, uh, GitHub repo. So you can go to the GitHub and you can point out questions there also. So we will have students who will alert us if there is any query and we will come back to you. So we welcome your participation, both as uh, developers as well as users. And and in whichever way you are able to take advantage of these solvers, we are very happy. Thank you.
So okay, I'll hand over the desk. Okay, so uh, so all the uh, participants uh, online, let's just mention that we are now ending this session today, and we will start again tomorrow, at ten o'clock as per schedule. The last session will be uh, the one uh, which I have replaced today. Okay, so that's the only change. Other than that, everything else will remain the same. Okay, so see you all tomorrow at ten a.m. Stop recording. Okay. Uh, I finished the recording. Uh, I, so I used to know people, man. Yeah, so there is a lamp. So, no, I think.